Thinky Up Your Life. Namaste, everyone. Welcome to the Charwak Podcast. This is your host, Kushal Mehra, welcoming you to another discussion. So today, uh, discussion is a follow-up to the last podcast. If you, if uh, all of you remember, uh, I had a discussion with Dr. Rai on my last podcast, uh, which was in regards to the latest paper that had come. There were two papers basically that had come. One was in science.com and one was in cell.com. And we were discussing the in detail the paper that had come in cell.com. And Dr. Rai was explaining the genetic aspect of it, the genetic diversity, or what what are the DNA results that were that were out of the Raki Gadi skeleton uh, specimen, and what are the probable conclusions that can be drawn from that. But obviously, that was the genetic aspect of the whole idea. There is another whole aspect, which is the archaeological aspect of the whole idea. And I'm very happy that today I have with me. Uh, Dr. Vasant Shinde, who is actually one of the lead authors of the of, of the paper which was published in Cell.com, and not only is he the lead author, Dr. Shinde uh, was uh, he, he is the former vice chancellor of Deccan College, uh, and he is also a well-known archaeologist. And uh, on top of that, uh, Dr. Vasant Shinde is actually someone who's if if I was to put it in uh, in uh, the common man's lingo. He's the man who's made this whole thing happen uh, uh, in the real sense. So, so Dr. Shinde, thanks a lot for coming on the podcast, sir. Thank you very much, sir. And so, you, you know, your efforts are very important because you are trying to reach, uh, you know, you are trying to take this knowledge to the people. That is very important. And I appreciate your initiative in this particular respect, sir. Uh, thanks a lot, sir. I really uh, appreciate all the encouragement. So, Dr. Shinde, let's start with this. Why don't you give everyone who's going to be watching uh, this right now live or going to be watching it later on a brief overview of the entire project itself, of the Raki Gadi excavations itself. Okay, well, see, so this project, you know, of Raki Gadi is a follow-up of the project that you know I initiated in 2006. In fact, before I started my work in Haryana, a very important region for understanding the development of human cultures. I had worked in Maharashtra, I had worked in Madhya Pradesh, then in Gujarat and Rajasthan. And I tried to understand, you know, the early farming communities of these regions, Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh and other regions. And then there, there I realized that, you know, that you know, most of the developments of the beginning of agriculture in these regions, outside the Harappan region, was some sort of a, you know, maybe developed, you know, it was a developed stage. And we thought that you know, the ideas have come from somewhere else. And the only answer to my mind came that, you know, it is the Harappans you know, who are so advanced. Maybe Harappans have provided, you know, maybe some kind of ideas and feedback to the people living in that region. So therefore, I thought, you know, we should understand about the Harappan people properly. And if we don't understand the Harappans, then perhaps you know, we will not be able to understand the development of the settled life and agriculture that has taken place in other regions. So overall, you know, we want to understand, if you want to understand any culture, then we cannot really study that particular culture in isolation. We have to study that culture in context with other you know, contemporary developments. And that is what you know, we thought of you know, doing that. Now, why I began my work in 2006 in, two, you know, in, in parts of Haryana, uh, which is considered to be the you know, very important region, uh, maybe important from the point of view of understanding the human development, cultural development in this particular part. And uh, also, a lot of uh, scholars believe that you know, the river flowing in that particular region, the River present is called Gagar. Now that was the ancient Saraswati. And you know, we have done a lot of work on this particular aspect. We have tried to understand you know, the context of the river Saraswati. And uh, even there are some scientific studies on this uh, done by Isro. So it is all clear that you know that you know Saraswati, the, you know, the ancient Saraswati is the present Gagar river. And since in you know, a major part of that was going through the you know Haryana. We thought that you know, we should study this particular region properly. And uh, you know, later uh, when I, I was working on the settlement pattern of the Harappan uh, culture, Harappan civilization, I realized that you know, nearly two-thirds of the Harappan settlements are located in the Saraswati Basin. 
So it was so important that you know during the Harappan times also the Indus basin was not that important, but it was the Saraswati basin which was very important. And therefore, you know, I began the work in fact in this particular part. Secondly, one of our students, a lady student from Deccan College, uh, her name was Katie Frenchman. Now she had carried out very extensive field work in a very difficult terrain, the difficult part of you know Rajasthan and Haryana in 1965. And that time she had recorded nearly 450 Harappan sites. But you know the information provided was not really enough to you know maybe make any kind of conclusion from that. So I thought that you know, I should visit most of the sites again and collect systematically the data from the sites. But then, you know, to my utter surprise, when I went, you know, uh, for, uh, you know, survey, I noticed that you know, most of the sites which were reported in 1965, they all have been destroyed because the, the sites are generally in the form of mounds. And people, what they people do, if I know they remove the soil, if I the mound, they completely flatten that so that they can convert that part into agricultural field. So in that process, you know, most of the sites were destroyed. And very few sites were left. And then I thought, you know, that, you know, I found one site called Parmana, very promising. So I began some, you know, rescue, some sort of a rescue or, you know, uh, salvage archaeology at that particular site. And when I started working, you know, I noticed, I discovered perhaps one of the biggest Harappan cemetery at Parmana itself. And, you know, when I was working at Parmana, I had a number of, you know, questions in my mind. One is that, you know, what is the beginning of the Harappan culture in this part? Because it was always believed that the beginning in this part is slightly later than the beginning found in the Saraswati, you know, in the uh, Indus Basin. So I wanted to find out about that. Secondly, I'm also very much interested, you know, you know that you know, Harappan civilization has evolved from the early phase. The Harappan culture, in fact, has been subdivided into three sub phases. One, the early phase we call as the early Harappan. The middle phase is called the you know, mature Harappan, in which we find the development of the city and towns. And then after you know, maybe around 2000 or 1900 BC, there is a decline. So that decline phase is called the late Harappan, which continues up to 1500 BC. So I wanted to find out you know, the journey of the Harappans from the early phase to the most prosperous or the mature phase. And we always knew that, you know, that there is a you know, transformation from early to mature. But how that transformation has taken place in their material culture, that was not clear. So I wanted to understand that particular part, you know, in, in this particular excavation. And the next and the third important question was about the Harappan people. Because there are a number of hypotheses, number of debate about who are the Harappan people. And earlier, the British archaeologists mostly when they started excavation at Harappa and Mohenjo-daro, they uh, made a hypothesis that perhaps you know, the, this advanced civilization would not have been established by the local people. So probably you know, people came from outside. Then, you know, maybe you know, their uh, point was towards Mesopotamia. So you will know, say that the Mesopotamian people came here, they were so aggressive that they conquered this part and they established the new civilization here. So these are the, some of the earlier hypotheses, and most of the earlier hypotheses were really not uh, considered on the basis of sorry. Uh, most of the hypotheses were not considered on the basis of the actual evidence or actual data. So these were all hypotheses that you know which were put forth, and then of course in 1960s and 70s, two uh, you know indigenous scholars one from India and other from Pakistan. One was, you know, the former director general of the Archaeological of India, A. Ghosh, Ananda Ghosh. So he started work in, in, you know, early 50s in parts of uh, Saraswati region. And at the same time, Rafik Mughal from Pakistan, he was doing his PhD in uh, in USA. And he was of the opinion that, you know, the mature phase is involved from the earlier phase. So he started looking at the pottery, particularly how the transformation of that particular you know, pottery has taken place from early to mature. And he also stressed upon the fact that you know, the mature phase evolved from the earlier phase. So for the first time, you know, these both impact, Egos and Rafik Mughal, they used some 
that up, you know, the agricultural data to make some hypothesis about the development of the Harappan civilization. So this is very important. And then, you know, I feel that, you know, unless you have sufficient data, both agricultural data as well as other scientific data, like you know, genetic data, you will not be able to understand the composition of the Harappan people. And uh, this particular question as you know, as who are the Harappan people, that cannot be really resolved unless you know, we have DNA from the scattered remains. So when I started to work at the site of Armana in 2006-07, then you know, I, I, I decided to excavate the, uh, the symmetry at Armana on a very large scale. And one of the aims was, of course, to understand the customs of the Harappans in, fact, in this respect. And also, we wanted to understand, you know, this, you know, we wanted to highlight this particular question. So we made, we excavated nearly 70 burials at that particular place. And then, you know, we tried to extract DNA from the scheduled remains. We were invited to you know, scholars from Japan and Korea also. And in spite of our best efforts, we were not able to get any DNA from the scheduled remains that we excavated at the site of Armana. And it was really miserable, you know, the scientists, you know, who came you know, to help us, they said that maybe the climatic condition is not good enough for the country. The soil is not good because it is more acidic and it is not really, you know, uh, helping the preservation of the DNA. So ultimately, they say that perhaps it is very difficult to get DNA from the remains. And at the end, in fact, now towards the end, around maybe 2010-11, then we came in contact with some Korean scientists from University of uh, Seoul National University. Uh, Seoul National University has a you know very uh, well developed uh, precaution while excavating the burials because uh, the modern DNA can get into the ancient DNA also. So it will be very difficult to you know separate the modern from the ancient DNA. So there will be a lot of contamination. So they said that you, know, you have to take proper precaution while excavating the burials. And then they suggested that maybe we should use gowns and then hand gloves. <coughs> uh, you know, gowns and hand gloves and you know, uh, masks, etc. So we did that, right? the entire team of our excavators. Uh, they did that, uh, they took the precaution. And this is uh, what we did it at Farmana that we excavated all the barriers at the time, 70 barriers. And we keep, kept them open for almost two months. Because we thought that the people should come and you know, see the you know excavated remains because they should not have any misunderstanding about the you know, remains that have been excavated. So that was our you know very simple and plain you know uh, idea behind that. But then in the in the process, you know, there was you know, sometimes there was rain, you know, strong sunshine. So that may have affected you know, the you know the survival of the DNA. And when we tested that, you know, at the end, we realized that you know, everything has slipped away. So here, you know, the Korean scientists suggested that now you excavate one body at a time, not all it together. And then, you know, you excavate that, immediately you document that, and immediately you track the samples and send to the laboratory. And then, you know, you can clean them again by taking the same precaution, and then try for the extraction of the DNA. So this is what we exactly you know we did that. And because of this particular, you know, precaution and the uh, you know, measure that you know, we had taken. Uh, fortunately, you know, we are able to get DNA from the Harappan culture remains, which are 4,500 years old. So this is how you know this you know, whole journey began. And then you know, what uh, what was decided initially that you know, the school study would be carried out in India itself because CCM in Hyderabad, Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology, where neither was working. So and uh, we thought that. You know, that that has a you know, good facility, and the scientists from that institute will be able to do this work of study. So we began the work working back on this, and initially, you know, we succeeded getting DNA from very, you know, a very small amount of DNA from five skeletal remains. And that small amount was not really good enough for making any judgment or any, any conclusion. And ultimately, we thought that, you know, perhaps we would not succeed in getting DNA. But then, you know, we, the last burial that we tested, the woman in fact, you know, from whom we got the strong DNA. So that was tested at the end. 
and then you know, finally we found a very very strong DNA from this particular woman. So what we did, in fact, we initially, you know, the analysis was carried out in CCMB, needless to help of you know other uh, laboratories in Bangalore and other places, and they realized that you know that you know, we do not have the advanced method you know, required for getting proper sequencing. And then also, you know, we also decided that you now if you only Indians carry out this particular work and publish that, you know, there will be a lot of challenges. You know, people will always have doubt, and they will always say that you know this result that you have generated is biased. So then we decided why not to involve the best scientists in the field. And let me tell you that you know they they will be uh, in Harvard Medical School in Boston. Now he's the most leading. You know, ancient DNA science in part of the world, and he has established a lab only for analyzing analyzing the samples from the herbal herbal sites. So that is a dedicated lab for this particular purpose. And then you know, how, you know, he took help of other you know maybe half a dozen other laboratories, and he got the you know maybe the most advanced testing done on this particular you know, sample, and he carried out nearly hundreds and you know maybe hundreds of Taste and the analysis on the samples, and he has spent you know, a huge amount of money on this particular. So then you know we thought that you know once you know we have the results from all of all of these, then only perhaps you know, we'll be you know uh, publishing that in the very you know, advanced and you know, top international journal. And that is on the, that is what we decided, you know we did that. And once it is published in international journal, that means you know it is accepted by the international community. And then only you know, after that only we get the announcement of the results of the DNA study that you know, we carried out. So this is how you know we began you know our endeavor in this particular respect. And uh, this is for the first time that you know anybody has succeeded in extracting DNA from 4,500 years samples in in, in the case of Cornwall. The climate of which is not only conducive for the preservation. But now we know that you know, what are the potential samples you know, for the preservation, and potential samples for the you know uh, sampling. So we will of course this is the beginning of course. this is not the end of course. this is the beginning of our studies, and we know that the sample at this particular stage is small. So we want to now work on you know much larger samples and samples from different you know geographical locations that we want to collect and analyze them, so that you know we can talk about the composition of the the whole population of the times. Also, the people you know beyond the Harappan region, their contemporaries, what are the relationship between the Harappans and the contemporaries? So that was we want to, you know, we would like to you know work on that particular part also. But uh, the one sample that not share and it can really tell us a lot of uh, very important and hidden in fact you know facets of the ancient culture and the people. All right, sir. So there's actually a lot to unpack within uh, within this itself. So so when we were excavating, so uh, 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 I'm just trying to understand. So so well, so the methods of excavation that are used when when we are going into an ancient burial site, like as you just mentioned, the weather is your biggest enemy when it comes to things like that because the kind of weather we have in India is actually not very suitable for uh, storage of ancient DNA. So, so when you were excavating uh, this particular site and when you came across this skeletal specimen in in Rakhi Gadi, could you actually tell us a little bit more about the difficulties that you guys had faced? No difficulties in terms of uh, the excavation itself. So, so how, how did you go about it? I'm actually really keen in understanding that aspect of it because I don't think so anybody would ever get to ask you that question. No, no, this is very important. Right now, people should know about this also. See, when I was work, working at Farmana, I worked at Farmana from 2007 to 2010, or three to four years. And every year, you know, I used to go to, you know, Rakigadi with my students. And every time I used to go to site of Rakigadi, I used to notice that, you know, there, are, there, are, there is more encroachment on the site. There is more damage to the site. And then you know, I was thinking that, you know, if this particular, you know, destruction and the encroachment, you know, continues, Whereas one day then you know, the the greatest Harappan site will be really vanished from the sea, and perhaps you know this very important you know treasure, cultural treasure, you know will not be available to the people. Then I thought that perhaps you know once we start you know the research you know at this particular site, perhaps 
this discussion will be stopped and perhaps you now we will convince the people uh, to uh, participate in the preservation and protection of the site so that is how you know we you know that was our you know initial you know, thinking and when i went there in fact in 2011 and i expressed my idea about the excavation of the site then i was uh, you know i was uh, there was so much opposition they said that you know we will not allow you to carry out the work in fact in this particular part because they said that you no know, we you no know, we you know we had you know there was a excavation happening in fact at this particular site before uh, by the archaeological survey of india and their grievance was that you know when the archaeological survey of india people came here we were not taken in the confidence and you people come here you excavate the site you get the publicity but we do not get anything from that so why should we allow you to excavate here so they said that you go back they said that you have a lunch with us and go back but i did not stop there in fact what i said that you now then i said uh, that i should go back again and i decided to speak uh, for one year in fact you now i was speaking with the people only then i told that you know that you know this is a very very important site and uh, you know you listen to me in fact you now let me explain the importance of the site and then perhaps you now you can tell you know whether i can work here or not i said that you no know, we are coming from pune and work in a village like rakhigadi and our intention is not to take a treasure from the site this is generally people think that you now when we go for the excavation people think that you now we go for the you know remove you know taking of the uh, treasure from the site i said that that is not our you know intention we want to really you know carry out scientific work at this particular site and i told the villagers the elderly people particularly i said that you know this particular village has played very important role in the history of the country and also in the history of the world and uh, i said that don't you want to know that you know what is the importance of this particular village you know it is one of the oldest village in fact villages in the in the indian subcontinent and then you know once you know we start the work i told them that once we start the work some you know developments will automatically follow and i said that you no know, one of our plans is to develop this site from tourism point of view and then i told that you no know, one city is developed from tourism point of view there will be local employment and the economy of the region in fact you know, will be completely transformed and that will really help the village and the surrounding area also and you know reluctantly they said okay okay i will, will allow you to carry out in a small you know, amount of work here and we began the work in fact in one of the you know one of the parts of the site which was owned by one of the villagers and the villagers you know the village, the owner of that land is to stay there but whenever we have, we used to work there he will stay there and he would make sure that you no know, we are not going beyond the area that he has demarcated and ultimately you know you know that that man you know when we were working he he learned a lot of things from us and then you know ultimately he became such a you know very, you know very famous guy in fact and then he started you know, inviting people from the village from the neighboring village and he used to narrate the history of this, you know very proudly the history of you know the village particular village so this is how you know this you know this work you know began then you know uh, the cemetery area which is again in fact in private land and people were already cultivating land there cultivating you know some crops there and usually you know if we excavate the sites between december to march because that is the ideal season for our excavation not rainy season or not the summer and uh, during the you know winter you know there is a standing crop in fact on the field uh, so it was a great challenge for us you know how to convince the farmer to allow us to you know carry out some work in that in the field but again the farmer you know cooperated with us and he allowed allowed us to carry out some work in fact in that in his field and that is how you know we began uh, our excavation and then of course you know, after that you know the people they, we were getting you know such a strong support from people and we never had any difficulties and let me today let me tell you today that the villagers have formed this you know the heritage protection group in the village and you know they are now the custodian of this particular site earlier you know people from other villages to come there they used to collect the artifacts from the site they used to dig here and there but now everything is stopped and they have realized 
some of the villagers in patna they have collected the artifacts from the site and they say that once the museum comes up here we will certainly donate all the objects so in a way you know they have protected the artifacts in patna from the site also so this is how you know and then finally you know with the help of the uh, rather it is a plan of the government of haryana that we develop the site from tourism point of view because it is ideal you know from delhi it is 150 kilometers and from airport you know one can you know maybe reach within 3 hours and there are a couple of other sites like parmana and you know virana around the site of rakhigadi which can also be you know developed from tourism point of view so we want to develop and we have two plans in fact one is that you know we want to excavate part of the city not on with large scale but at least a part of the city where people which can be protected and people can go there in fact any time and have a feel of the harappan street harappan harappan structure so we want to develop that you know, sort of a open air museum in fact there and then you know we also have a plan of developing a proper museum there where all the artifacts that is that are excavated that that will be displayed but you know there you know the display in the museum is not going to be displayed like any other museum what we want to do here in fact we know that the harappans uh, they are the first you know you know uh, maybe the founders of the indian civilization and uh, we also know that you know the harappans have contributed immensely to the history of the country and to the history of the world so we want to highlight that particular part of the harappans in this in this particular museum because people know about the lifestyle of the harappans but they don't know what is the contribution made by the harappans so we want to showcase that secondly you now we want to showcase you now the advancement made in basic sciences and technologies what we call as the indian knowledge system so that needs to be showcased also and finally you now we would also showcase the relevance of the harappan you know studies relevance of the harappan technologies harappan you know knowledge system how relevant that is even today that part we want to display which is not done in fact in any other museum in fact in the country or rather in the in the whole of south asia so that is our plan in fact now at the site of rakhi all right sir so now uh, uh, let's uh, deep dive into the actual evidence uh, found in the archaeological uh, excavations and actually uh, something in relation to that somebody has asked a very good question in the live uh, chat itself uh, so parthoraj chakravarti has asked uh, has any relation between the middle harappan phase and black and red ware culture and ochre colored pottery culture been observed and does the mature harappan phase continue into painted grey ware culture so uh, you could take uh, this question and also explain the other archaeological uh, details that have been found here in this specific uh, you know site of rakhi gadi say so the black and red pottery Uh, is very much you know you know uh, very much indigenous now there is a site called uh, 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 in uh, mid ganga basin uh, there is a site called lavura deva which was excavated by the up state archaeology department and they they have excavated this black and red pottery dated back to 6500 bc so that is the earliest evidence of black and red pottery anywhere in the world and then you know from there in fact you now we are getting this particular pottery you know associated with almost you know all the you know material you know all the cultures up to the beginning of the uh, this like period in fact in the indian subcontinent so there is a continuity and certainly we can say that this is a very much indigenous development in this part as far as the harappans are concerned we do get of course you know the black and red pottery at the site of lothal in gujarat we know we have the black and red pottery at uh, uh, farmana we have black and red pottery in other sites but the percentage of the black and red pottery is very small in the harappan levels but contemporary to the harappans uh, you know there was a culture called meva you know ahar culture in, in rajasthan in, in mewar part of rajasthan and the ahar culture you know which flourished from 4000 bc up to 1500 bc now this culture had very close contact with harappans so there was a trading contact between the ahar people and the harappans and naturally you know, because there was a lot of give and take so some black and red pottery has come from the harappa you know ahar region we don't have the evidence of the manufacturing of black and red pottery in the in fact in the harappa region but these are the people you know periphery people who were already you know using that type of pottery and they were trading with the harappans 
so through that in fact you know, the black and red pottery has come and uh, as i mentioned that you know it continues till maybe second century third century ad in the indian subcontinent so that tradition is very strong in fact in the indian subcontinent when you know when they real, you know uh, discovered some few shirts uh, at the site of harappa and mohenjodaro when they were excavating in early part maybe in 30s and 40s uh, the british scholars thought that you know particularly uh, sir mortimer wheeler he thought that you know this pot has come from egypt because you know he had worked in that part and he had observed in pattern this type of pot in that part but now as i say that you now recently you know, we have excavated so many sites and the antiquity of the black and red pottery is going back you know to 6500 to 700 bc so this is very much you know uh, local pottery and which is found in fact uh, you know in the harappan region also and that pottery has come in fact in the harappan region because of the contact problem so so now now uh, i wanted to understand a little more about the archaeological evidence specifically to the rakigadi site and its connection to i mean the biggest elephant in the room the aryan migration or the aryan invasion whichever word people want to call it there seems to be a debate even on whether we should call it a aryan invasion or a aryan migration and and it's all over the place so so what was the archaeological evidence that sir you have discovered in your excavations in rakigadi or in the in the general uh, saraswati sindhu if we don't want to use the saraswati sindhu name so we can use a different nomenclature we call it the indus valley civilizational uh, area which which includes different sites which includes uh, rakigadi which includes dholavira which includes rothal etc etc so what has yeah. been the evidences that have been found and what is its impact on the aryan migration or the aryan invasion theory itself see now let me tell you now before this uh, genetic data genetic results were out now we had a very strong you know evidence in fact in the archaeological record indicating a local development i will cite the example of the site of mehergarh now this site is you know which is located in golan pass in pakistan in uh, you know in tachi plain now this site was excavated by a french scholar jeb jaris for almost you know 13 to 14 years uh, started in 70s early 70s and continued till the early 80s and here you know that you know he found a complete cultural sequence for the what we call as the protostatic phase in indian subcontinent so he found in fact you now the beginning of the settled life at this particular site is dated to around 7000 bc in fact you no know, it is still going back in fact you no know, recent you know they are doing some more work on the chronology of the beginning of the settled life in this part and uh, the chronology is going back to 7500 bc now so right from the beginning in the early stage we can see the you know that you know this you know people have started some efforts in settling down at one place and then of course they started cultivating they started domestication that what was site and then you know they were constantly then evolving progressing at this particular site in the second stage uh, they introduced pottery and why i say that you no know, this pottery was introduced by the local people because it is very crude and handmade and one can see that you know that you know, they have carried out some lot of experiment experiment on that so very crude and handmade pottery in complex level and then of course you know, we also find the presence of lot of other you know goods along with the pottery so like you know you find beads also along with that then we find other jewelries lot of tools al along with and mostly stone tools so this is the you know material that you found and this is how they began in the next stage you know we can see the development both in pattern in pottery manufacturing technique as well as in the you know technique of manufacturing some of the crafts like beads and bangles that they, they have used so there's a gradual evolution in fact so from 7500 or 7000 bc up to the beginning of the harappan culture we can see that constant development even that development is reflected in the structures also not only pottery the structures are very small you know so, you know mud structures in the in the early stage in the next stage you know, we find slightly you know bigger complexes in the third stage you now still bigger complexes and there is a modicum of planning and in the fourth stage you now they are transformed into a plant settlement so that type of you know evidence is found at the site of mehergarh 
so it is quite clear and then you know the excavator jeb jarij has identified eight different stages of development at this particular site and at each stage each you know step uh, we can see the introduction of some harappan elements for example in the early stage we, we see the evidence of the development of terracotta art you know there is a evolution in that also in some stage you know they have you know introduced seals harappan seals then lapid lapidary and so this is these are the different you know materials and the uh, crafts that have that have been uh, introduced and ultimately the same people were transformed into harappan culture they developed the harappan culture and in the harappan as i mentioned earlier that we have early stage or what we call as the formative stage and the developed stage and the decline stage so the formative from the beginning of the early harappan to the mature harappan we have got very strong evidence about the transformation in fact in the saraswati basin so from here you know i would like i would like to cite the examples from the saraswati basin now at the site of you know virana which was excavated by the architect of saraswati india which is again close to the site of rakhigadi now that at that site you know we found series of dates for the from the early levels from the earliest levels and those dates were ranging between 6500 bc to 5500 bc and initially nobody was ready to accept this particular dates because everybody had preconceived notion that the harappan civilization has originated in the indus plain and we have early dates in fact from the indus plain and the sites in fact in other regions are slightly later that was the you know, notion of the historians and the archaeologists but then you know when we found the early dates then a lot of doubts were raised some say that you no know, we have you have dates only from one side the dates are not good maybe maybe, maybe there is a lot of contamination happening because of that you are getting this erratic dates so we did not react to that immediately right then we started producing more data and then you know i actually i excavated sites like farma you know giravad before that then mitatal farmana and finally rakhigadi and at all the sites you know the dates for the lowermost levels of the harappan level, harappan culture is going back to 5500 to 6000 bc to be on safer side no i yes to be on safer side i am putting them at 5500 bc so this is very important and then you know, when i announced these dates the media immediately said that you know, the, the origin of the harappan civilization lies in fact in the saraswati basin and later people started moving to the, to the indus basin i don't make that claim i also feel that you know there may be sites in the indus plain also where the dates could go back as early as 5500 or 6000 bc so we need to check maybe investigate that more in fact in that part also so at virana at giravad at farmana and also at rakhigadi now we are getting proper evidence about from 5500 bc to 2500 bc we are getting proper evidence of the transformation development again you know uh, that trans that development is visible in their structural elements also the first harappans you know they develop very small flimsy circular structures some of them were circular huts some of them were circular pit dwellings and they were always you know this huts or you know pit dwellings they were always in clusters three or four you know cluster form or the huts form one cluster and function of each one was different right one hut was used for dwelling purpose one for cooking purpose one for storage purpose like that so this is the beginning of the you know harappan you know lifestyle in this region and in the next stage you know the you know pit dwellings were you know transformed into four ground structures and the shapes also from circular they became rectangular or squares and then you will find you know you know small rectangular square structures coming in the second stage in the third stage the site become more and now people have introduced the typical harappan building material like bricks in proper ratio and in the fourth stage you now we find you know again the modicum of planning then the important elements associated with the structure like you know bathing platforms then toilets etc coming up along with the structures and some may be rudimentary drainage system 
and then of course it was finally transformed into a well planned flourishing low city and town in Patna Park. So that development is very, very much visible, and some development can be noticed in this in the pottery also. The pottery of the you know lowermost level is again you know crude and handmade, and gradually it becomes refined, and in the Harappan level it becomes a very fine, fast wheel made pottery, classical pottery in fact. So there's a gradual development in that part also. So all this evidence, evidence from Mehrgarh as well as from the Saraswati Basin, clearly indicates that you know there is a local development happening, and you know these are the local people you know, who are constantly striving hard to you know develop into a proper civilization, and that happened in Padar Pathan Bay in BC. So this is a transformation from the you know, very small and modest life. to a city life and that is visible in fact in the archival data there's no doubt about that this particular data is you know is public in public domain anybody can you know look at this particular data and data will always give us true picture of that particular period so this is very very, very important now here the question is that right from the beginning the genetic evidence has revealed that the people from the beginning of the settled life now they are they have continued the ancestry of this people has continued and this ancestry is different from the ancestry of the iranians and the ancestry of the steppe people now what is happening perhaps you now when people were transforming from hunting gathering to agriculture stage perhaps you not know, they they have split into two groups one went to you know iran and one went to south you know south asia and they were developing independently and south asian were developing independently but then at the same time when they were you know they started producing various crafts and you know various other you know material culture they began to develop contact with other regions they developed contact with iran also they developed contact with middle east also with central asia also and they were getting a lot of maybe raw materials from that part maybe you know some kind of you know goods from that part and in that respect when this was happening there was a movement of the people some people were coming here for trade purpose some people were going from here to that region so that is that was constantly happening right from the beginning and because of that naturally you know there was maybe mixing up the gene happening at you know regular intervals but that gene has not really you know completely transform or change the ancestry of the people the ancestry of the people has been same and that is you know very much clear in fact in the archaeological data also secondly i uh, always believe that you know that uh, i try to you know study the literature and the archaeological data and the archaeological data and the literature clearly may indicate that you know that the harappans and the rigvedic they are on the same page because you know in the rigvedic texts in fact there is a mention about river saraswati hundreds you know hundred times in fact river saraswati is mentioned very important river pious river and it is mentioned that you know there are flourishing cities and towns flourishing you know settlements along the bank of river saraswati now we investigated this whole you know thoroughly in fact you know we scanned the whole area uh which is you know part of the saraswati and we recorded each and every archaeological remains from the, this particular area and we found that you know there are only harappan cities there are some maybe few settlements of the earlier period but there are maybe scattered here and there few settlements of the later period which are again scattered here and there but you know large number of harappan settlements are located there so suppose the you know the vedic vedic texts has mentioned about the You no know, flourishing settlements in this part probably they have recorded the harappan settlements this is my argument secondly you know the rigvedic texts also mentions about you know the flourishing cities and towns along the banks of river saraswati now the biggest harappan city is located in that part the site of rakhigadi then there are half a dozen you know maybe you know towns located in this part so large number of cities and towns are located in this part also so and we do not have you know the later period cities located in this part maybe one or two big sites only but they are not cities later period 
it is only the harappan cities which are found in this region so suppose you know the rigvedic text has mentioned about the cities and towns probably they have mentioned about harappan cities that is my argument thirdly you know the uh, rigvedic text also talks about the ideal plan of the city it it says that you know the city is divided into three parts and the only evidence in this respect comes from the harappan city of dholavira which is located in kutch gujarat and that you know you don't find that type of plan but in you know in other or uh, you know later cities in 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 subcontinent so that is there is a you know supporting evidence for that also archaeological evidence for that also rigvedic text also mentions about the fire worship we have excavated number of fire altars uh, from the sites located in the saraswati basin only we do not have this evidence even at harappa and mohenjo outside the saraswati region so probably you know i connect this you know to the uh, to the text again Uh, it mentions about you know the different shapes of the you know fire altars yoni shape and a human shape etc exactly same evidence is found at at uh, rakhigadi at uh, kalimanga etc so there is a evidence in fact you know, which can you know corroborate the evidence found in fact in the you know, in the text so this is you know, and then only you know the evidence you know, we do not have strong evidence for uh, one you know one uh, important criteria that is horse rigvedic text talks about you know the you know rigvedic people and horse go hand in hand but we do not have very strong evidence of horse in the harappan rivers but let me again cite you one example here there is a site called sukhodra in kutch part of gujarat close to the site of dolavira and the bones from the site were studied by two different groups one headed by one professor boponi from hungary and the other group was headed by richard meadow from harvard university so bokoni you know after examining this bone you know this bones he was a you know very well known archaeologist in fact in the world so his analysis revealed that these are the bones of the properly domesticated horse and the same specimens were studied by richard meadow and meadow said that you no know, these are not the bones of domesticated horse but they are the bones of wild donkey wild ass so here you know the you know the scientific community is divided secondly you now we also should not forget that the site of lothal has produced a terracotta figure in a figure in a horse so horse was very much there we don't get bones in fact in last scale perhaps you know horse may not have been you know part of their you know diet in fact like other you know cattle was the part of the diet but not maybe maybe horse or not so because of that you know we are not getting the evidence of that and the second evidence that which is lacking is the evidence of the vedic gods you know this is you know agni is not there varun is not there indra is not represented but you know let me tell you that varun you know and then you know uh, this uh, agni etc now varun will not be worship maybe in the form of any you know anthropomorphic form maybe you know it is just worship as a god you know nature god we do not find you know evidence for that but shiva is very important very much there in fact Shiva, according to some, it is a non-Vedic god. But let me tell you that you know, right from maybe Kailash, you know, Manas Sarovar, down south up to you know this uh, uh, Rameshwar, we have you know we find this you know this particular god worship all over the all over the country. So I believe that you know this was the god of universal god of you know Indians in fact right from the beginning. So he is there in fact. But you know, still you know, we need more evidence. In fact, in this respect, more evidence in fact to you know whether whether there was a horse or not, we need to find out. And we also need to find out about the why the horse represented in fact in the Harappan rivers. So we need some more evidence. But there is a strong evidence indicating that the Harappans and the Vedic people are one and the same. Now, based on this, now the you know I take back the Vedic culture. To 2500 BC, contemporary to the Harappan civilization. Now, if that is the case, the Harappans were so advanced. They were the city builders. In fact, they have contributed immensely to the history of the world. They have taught, in fact, the world how to build cities, modern cities. And you know, the civic amenities, the drainage system that the Harappans developed was unique in fact in the contemporary world. And one of the important contribution of the Harappans was the water harvesting or water management. which was unique in fact in the country what you are today that is very much relevant 
So if the if the Harappans were so advanced, and they were trading with you know the Mesopotamians, with the Persian Gulf people, with the Gulf you know, region, with Egypt, with Central Asian people, then naturally they may have had proper language. They had a script, of course, which is not decipherable, but they had a proper script. And also, I believe that you know, they had a proper language. And I firmly believe that maybe some kind of maybe early form of you know Sanskrit was spoken by these people because Sanskrit has a deep root in fact in the Indian subcontinent. So probably you know the Sanskrit you know is originated, and then you know as and when people were coming in contact with outside world, the Harappans started moving outside the world, outside the world also, and the outside peoples were coming here also. When that was happening, you know, this interaction was happening. Perhaps you know the ideas of languages also were spreading, and that is how you know, we find one of area where we have the Harappan influence. On that area, we find the, you know the Indo-European language spoken or Indo-Aryan language spoken. So I believe that you know, the Indo-European language has not come from outside. But probably you know it is it is probably originated here, and then you know, from here in fact you know, it started moving outside. And from there, you know, maybe different groups have evolved. So that is my view, right? And these views are based on the actual data that we have. And then, of course, you know, from Harappans, from the gene, in fact, you know, from the ancestry, it is clear that from the Harappans till today, there is a continuity in the ancestry. The ancestry is not broken. So again, this is very important. That suppose some people say that they have, you know, Aryans came in large group in Indian subcontinent. And they occupied large area in fact North India. Then that means you know, they could have you know replaced the ancestry in fact in this part, which is not happening. The ancestry is not broken, but that ancestry continues till today. So my view is that you no, know, it is not the my Aryan or the you know the migration or the you know invasion of the people from outside, whether you call them Aryan or whatever. But there is no evidence for that. For last 10,000 years, in fact, there is no evidence about that. But at the same time, the Harappans and the contemporary people from outside the South Asia, they were interacting with each other and they were moving in pair, you know, in these regions because of which there is a mixing happening at regular intervals. But at the same time, the gene has not been, you know, been replaced at all. The ancestry has not been replaced. So that is happening because of the movement of the people not because of invasion or the migration of the people. That is that is my view. And you know, today you now when we come we have compared you know large number of modern samples, DNA samples, with the Harappan samples. And we found that you know a large section of South Asian people have the same Harappan ancestry. So that is continuing here. And that is reflected again in the in fact in the archaeological remains also. From Harappan times till modern times, you can see the continuity. I will give the example of the site of Rakhigadi. When you know, we move in fact in the site of Rakhigadi, you know, in the village of Rakhigadi, when we go around, when we are excavating there, we get the feeling that we are moving in the Harappan village because the exact the streets are exactly like Harappan streets. Even the modern house is based on the Harappan plan, exactly the same. It is the open courtyard. And rooms on all sides. It's a typical Harappan plan. You find that also. The you know the ovens, the tandoors used by the you know by the modern people, they look exactly like the Harappan tandoors. They contribute that. Even today, people are making earthen pots, and the earthen pots, they shape-wise, also the motive-wise, they look exactly like Harappan model, Harappan earthen pots. In fact, now if you keep one modern earthen pot and one Ancient urban pot side by side, it will be confusing in fact, you know, which one is modern and which one is ancient. So there's that much similarity. The shape of the pots, even people have switched over from urban to maybe metal pots, the shape of the pot has not changed. So that means you know, the food habit of the people has not changed for the last 5,000 years. The agriculture system, agriculture tools, the medium has changed, but you know, these things have not really changed. So there is a very strong continuity from Harappans till the modern times, and that is very important. That is reflected in the material culture, and now it is reflecting back in the ancestry of the people. So this is really important to understand. 
So, sir, if I was to summarize this uh, for for the layman, so so from the data that you have experienced, so if we look at it from purely from an archaeological point of view, so what we can summarize is that what we see happening in India in all these various sites through your excavations and through your analyses is is a gradual development of a continuous civilization. Now, if there was some sort of an outside invasion or migration, I mean, I, I don't get it why there is so much resistance now in a certain uh, sense, uh, section of the academia that says, oh, we don't believe in an invasion. We believe in an our, uh, our, our migration. But my, my, my counter to them is you might call it anything. You might call it the Aryan dance theory. But what you explain below now, now, let us take a very simple example, sir. Let us say the argument that, you know, you find the R1A1 haplogroup only in the paternal side, right? That, that's the argument given. Now, if that is the argument given, then, then this argument, when it is used in the European side, is that, oh, the, these R1A1 haplogroup carriers came in Europe and they literally butchered all the men there. So... If that was the argument, then the same argument should be given. At least there should be intellectual honesty and consistency when you're giving an argument for the Indian side. So call it an invasion. It's okay. You can call it an invasion, but you want to call it a migration, explain an invasion, and then dance around it. And then and and now I wanted to, sir, uh, clarify this because there have been so many confusing media reports. And I have to ask you this question because it, it's only fair for the discussion. Now, what has happened is you have you and Dr. Rai have made a very clear stand that you don't see a, Aryan, a case for an Aryan migration or an Aryan invasion. But there were a couple of... Uh, Paragraphs in the study, uh, where uh, I mean, obviously, in the Narsiman et al., Narsiman et al., which is in science.com, they say the there is the evidence for the theory that these languages spread from the steppe uh, people, and they obviously give the example of the you know shared distinctive features of the Balto Slavic and the Indo Iranian languages. Actually, to be honest, uh, very honest, uh, I, I I have read a bit of the material on the on, on that side. It actually, if we were to purely study it from our Indo-Iranian Balto Slavic languages, it actually makes for an east to west case, not a west to east case. But uh, but that that is for for another day. But the point here is that there is some confusion regarding some paragraphs in the cell.com study also, which does mention the movement of the Indo-European peoples. But obviously, you and Dr. Rai are not agreeing with it. So would you like to clarify uh, some of that confusion? Because a lot of people emailed me when I had announced that I'm talking to Dr. Shinde. They're like, please ask him this question. We're back in action. Sorry about the delay. And uh, so, so Dr. Shinde, as I had asked you the question, there seems to be confusion uh, regarding the, the cell.com paper and there are certain paragraphs in that. And then, uh, you know, relating to those paragraphs, a lot of things have come in the media where, where uh, like I had mentioned to you on, on the website scroll.in, there was an article written uh, by a couple of people. One was written by Shoaib Danyal and one was written by... Uh, I think it was Girish Shahane. And, and they have said that, you know, there seems to be a confusion and the Indian scientists are being used to show that uh, there is no such thing as an RN migration or an RN invasion when the paper says something else. So, sir, what do you have to say to all of that? Yeah, see, what is happening now, you know, I, I have been following, following up this uh, since uh, my press conference. And uh, I have noticed that, you know, some people are really confused. Uh, because you know, if you read both the papers, there is a little bit confusion. Let me make it clear that you know the data that we have published in Shade. Now that was not really available in fact no, when we wrote that uh, you know science paper. And uh, what we meant in fact in the science paper is that you know, we are always talking about the interaction, the mingling of the people from different regions. Kind of invention, but now you know the things are becoming very, very clear. Now the comments that have been made by certain you know uh, people, let them let me make it clear that just most of them are amateur. Very few scientists have really, really made any kind of you know uh, comments on this in particular respect. In fact, I read you know I read one article written by Satyajit. Uh, Satyajit uh, Kar, in fact, from Satyajit, yeah, from Pune. But he's a very well-known DNA scientist, and he said that you know, this is a you know the monumental achievement you know these people have done, in fact. 
So those you know who are you know mature and who have nothing to do with the science or archaeology, they are making this type of comments, and only maybe handful of people are misled by them. So here it is quite clear. In fact, in both archaeological records, when I gave the press conference, I did mention about the archaeological records and also the genetic records. It is not that you know, we are making all this presumption or conclusions based on only one data. That is not true. And in both, in fact, the data, archaeological data as well as in uh, genetic data, we do not find any kind of you know any kind of migration of the people from outside at any stage. On the contrary, you know, that you know, we are getting the Harappan gene at Gonur in fact in Turkmenistan and also in, in Shari Sokta. So it is quite likely that you know, people, Harappan people are starting moving that side more. And so that is very important. Secondly, you know, the Indo-European language, you know, there is always you know, a big question mark about you know the when this particular language has originated, where exactly it is it has originated. And if suppose that language has a Sanskrit base, as we know most of the scholars believe, then Sanskrit is a local language, in fact. And if the Vaitik, we associate the Vaitik with the Harappans, I am sure that you know, the Harappans, you know, who are so adventurous, they must have developed this particular language, maybe proto-Sanskrit language, from which you know most of the European or most of the Indo-European languages have evolved. So it is not, you know, there is no confusion. People should not get confused that there is a continuity from the beginning till modern times. Secondly, you now we are also getting, you know, the, you know, evidence about the local development, local origin and development in the, in the modern culture. Had people come from outside in a large number, they would have brought their own culture in fact with them, which is not reflected at any stage in the Indian subcontinent. So how do we accept, you know, that you know, people have come from outside in a large number, they migrated here or they invaded here? There is no evidence for that. And why we are consisting, you know, with the same, you know, same old theory that you know people have come from outside, and if you want to prove that, I don't understand. And those who talk about the migration and invasion from outside, they are purely doing it on speculation basis. On this is their preconceived notion. And only they're doing it only on unscientific data. In fact, so we have the scientific data, which is produced by the topmost scientists in fact, the world. And the title itself is making clear that, you know, that there is no, you know, maybe gene of the steppe people or in, of the Iranians in fact in the Indian subcontinent. Mixing is happening that we are accepting that right from the beginning. That people were moving in fact, you know, in different regions. The movement is already clear. And in both the papers, you know, we want to make it a point that it is a movement of the people that we are talking, not about the migration, not about the you know invasion of the people from outside. And uh, simply you know, be, you know, making a guess, only you think because you think that the Indo-European you know languages come from outside and it is introduced by the people from you know maybe outside region. That has no base, in fact. So unless you know there is a base for that, you cannot really talk about all these things. So we are making it quite clear that you know, this data that is scientifically produced needs to be thoroughly understood, and people need to believe the scientific data and not the unscientific data. So they should not really mislead the people. that at all because this particular project was started in 2009. And suppose we had got the you know, results in fact in, you know, in 10, 2010 or 11, and we had published in 2012, we would have published the same data in fact. So nobody has really asked us to you know, maybe modify our, our stand or the scientific data. And the entire data, of course, is in public domain. Whoever wants to see that, they are always welcome. And they should be proper and you know, competent people, of course, to analyze the data that is you know, that is produced and to understand the data that is very important all right so, so I, in in my opinion i think the confusion stems from the basic thing that in the paper itself in cell.com there is that little paragraph that does speculate about maybe the indo-european people did come out of the steppe and the steppe people are the indo-european language carrier so i think that is what everybody seems to be clinging on to the uh you know clinging on and uh, th and that has led to the confusion so are you saying that uh, you categorically even deny that that aspect that uh, may, has maybe guessed in the paper itself. 
yeah yeah you know i will uh, you know i will always say that in that you know, even that particular hypothesis or you know, some case is made uh, because you know we did not have scientific data from the site of bakkeri that time and the science paper does not include the you know, data from bakkeri now we have combined both the data now and then you know you come to the conclusion and that is you know that is the argument we are making that use this uh, you know the most you know scientific data that is produced from site of bakkeri and on the basis of that now we are revising our you know maybe what your statements you know maybe conclusion statements is they write in that paper so i am writing now you know maybe a clear picture on that and i am going to publish that you know shortly so that people got to know about the reality and certainly you know, we need to bring that part all right perfect sir so, so just one last question and because i had asked this to dr rai also that it's exciting to know that you're going to be writing a new paper explaining your point of view even further to clarify the confusions uh, in regards to the two papers that came out but sir what are the so i wanted to close on 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 uh, a note on what we can look forward to about the future because after uh, you know dr my my chat with dr rai i mean actually i was surprised that in such a discussion where a scientist is explaining technical things i usually don't get so many emails and messages but i was flooded with emails and messages saying when can you get dr rai again on the podcast and ask him what are the future projects that dr rai and dr shinde have are going to take over so sir wa wow, can, can you give us uh, before we uh, you know close the discussion can you give us a look into what what kind of projects are you going to do in the future yeah immediately after the publication of this paper myself uh, niraj and uh, david uh, you know rick we all spoke in fact we were on skype and now we have already you know uh, you know uh, decided our future strategy in this respect now we have spoken about you know be you know small portion of the harappan population so we want to understand you know the total composition of the harappan population there will be a lot of diversities that we need to understand secondly you know, we need to understand you know the harappas interaction with the contemporary population their relations with the contemporary population so therefore now we are planning to generate more data firstly from within the harappan region because the harappans you know were spread in different geographical zones in you know in gujarat you know we have to have data from that part from rajasthan also and if we are lucky to get data from harappa and mohenjo we need to have data from that and then only perhaps you know, we can talk about the composition of the harappan population and then you know we have a lot of data from the contemporary population like the chalkutik farmers neolithic farmers in south india so we want to analyze that data we want to generate more data on that respect and certainly you know, we will be doing that and then you know from neolithic chalkutik then we move to the iron age and we want to see you now how they continue the impact in the in the ancestry and the genealogy that uh, that will be there we have a lot of archaeological data so we know what is the archaeological data now we want to generate more genetic data on these aspects well, well uh, i think uh, guys uh, this pretty much sums up the entire discussion uh, i think i have clarified all, all the possible angles that there were to be clarified i have covered your super chats and uh, uh you know what uh, i i apologize for the bit of a hiccup in between sometimes you know technology gives up uh, uh you know and we are, i apologize for the minor hiccups in between uh you know uh, sometimes uh, these kinds of things happen so so dr shinde once again uh, thanks a lot for coming on the podcast and as someone who is an uh, a passionate follower of the aryan migration aryan invasion out of india hypothesis and thesis uh, or theory uh, you know i have been reading this literature uh, since the last 9 to 10 years and i have been following it very passionately i once again want to thank you for coming on the podcast and uh, i hope to ha- have you on many more such discussions Yeah, thank you very much, Kushal, and for your initiative and taking our voice to the people. But that is really important. Thank you very uh, much. My my pleasure, sir. So so guys, uh, you know, uh, once again, thanks a lot for watching this podcast. Apologies for the hiccups in between. Uh, as you guys know, you know, subscribe to the podcast, like, share this discussion. I'm on Patreon now. You can go on Patreon and support me on Patreon, where the, you know we'll be doing a lot more cool stuff. And uh, till then, you know, namaste. Take care. Goodbye. Have a nice day. Same.